Hi everyone, Woe Kelly here. In this video I want to discuss the Panzer Ace books. Specifically I want to talk about why you should not read them. Because they're full of lies. No, really. You really shouldn't read them unless you'd like to be misled. Let me explain. If you're an avid reader of World War II literature, then there's a good chance you've come across the Panzer Ace books, or may even own some of these books, as I do. In fact, the Panzer Ace books have been hugely influential since their publishing in 1992, doing a great deal to popularize the concept of the Panzer Ace in the English-speaking world. Even some 30 years after their publishing, these books are still highly rated on Amazon. It's therefore unfortunate that such highly influential books are, at their base, highly biased works which trade historical fact for the sake of gripping reading. Let's take a look at all the reasons the Panzer Ace books are awful and why you should not read them. Now, I'm a firm believer in judging the quality of a work by its own merits, rather than dismissing it all due to certain viewpoints the author holds. It's why I can both be a Patreon supporter of Tick while also unironically still subscribing to Shit Werebuse on Reddit. I really like his Battlestorm videos. Nonetheless, it's worth looking at the author of the Panzer Ace books, Franz Korosky, as many of the problems I will highlight with his books stem from who he is. Now, much of the information here comes from historian Dr. Roman Topol, a frequent guest on the channel Military History Not Visualized, who wrote an article of Franz Korosky. See the link below. So who is Franz Korosky? Well, with over 400 books published during his lifetime, Franz Korosky is probably the most prolific writer you have never heard of. His writings go as far back as World War II, when he was a Wehrmacht radio technician serving in Greece, submitting stories to the soldiers' newspaper Watch in the Southeast. Kurowski wrote many different kinds of works, from fictional works for adolescents to serials and women's magazines. It is, however, his contribution to World War II literature which has seen his biggest impact. And, well, his books seem to focus on a specific theme. See if you can spot it in these titles. Panzer Aces 1, German Tank Commanders of World War II. Panzer Aces 2, Battle Stories of the German Tank Commanders of World War II. Panzer Aces 3, German Tank Commanders in World War II. Luftwaffe Aces, German Combat Pilots of World War II. Infantry Aces, wasn't aware there was such a thing. The German Soldier in Combat in World War II. Panzer Grenadier Aces, might as well include them I guess. German Mechanized Infantrymen in World War II. The Brandenburg Commandos, Germany's Elite Warrior Spies in World War II. Elite Panzer Strike Force, Germany's Panzer Lear Division. Knights of the Wehrmacht, Knights Cross Holders of the U-Boat Service. Knights of the Wehrmacht, Knights Cross Holders of the Fallschirmjäger. Panzer, the dramatic story of the German armored forces and their brave soldiers. Battle of the Giants, Sacrifice of the Panzer Man. Tiger, the story of a legendary weapon. Yeah, Kurowski's titles are filled with the kinds of buzzwords that get wearaboos hot and flustered. Ace, Elite, Knight, Sacrifice. And the content matches, telling stories of extraordinary feats by German soldiers and airmen during the war. In Dr. Topol's article on Franz Kurowski, he states, Franz Kurowski was one of the writers who shaped the popular image of the Wehrmacht. To this day, he is perceived as a reliable German historian, especially abroad. The fact is, however, that his works are not only biased, but also partially based on falsified sources. Dr. Topol explains in some detail the various historiographical sins committed by Kurowski, from exaggerated real-life events to making up other ones. I won't cite everything in full, as I don't want to essentially plagiarize Dr. Topol's article, but I would like to reference some of the damning comments German veterans who Kurowski wrote about, or who assisted him, say about his later works. German veteran and Knight's Cross holder Georg Bose states, Mr. Kurowski often writes such enthusiastic stories in his books. They certainly make for very gripping reads, but they are not what really happened. Just recently he wrote another Lancer about the assault artillery in which he mentions me a few times, but I have absolutely no idea where this could have taken place. detailed personal account of the assault gun units of the German Wehrmacht, the accounts of battles of the technology involved in the comprehensive history of assault guns is unprecedented. I love this book. In Infantry Aces, Krauski wrote a chapter on Knights Cross holder Elfried Schneiderite, who had passed away by that time. Fellow veteran Rolf Kleinman provided Krauski with a record of what veterans who fought with Elfried Schneiderite said about him. However, according to Kleinman, 
Krowski just filled the facts with fanciful tales, which, in the eyes of fellow combatants, made the whole story quite worthless. I suggested some improvements, but Krowski never reacted to those. Talking later to Dr. Topol, Kleinman states, Krowski tends to fill in everything he does not know with his own crazy ideas. He made all this up just to fill lines. Book is action packed with true stories from German Vex. The action ranges from frozen hell of the east and the French are slowing the Allied advance in the west from the Iron Cross. Second class to the Knights Cross with empty seats in English. Everything for their comrade, family, and country for a low price. This book is a steal great buy. For his 2007 book on Kurt Knispel, a Tiger tank commander with 165 kills to his credit and who died in the final days of the war, Kurowski cites fellow veteran Alfred Rubel as a key witness for many accounts in the book. However, Rubel, when he read the book, was shot and called the book. A sheer outrage. What he wrote in there is all made up. Alone the quotes he put in my mouth, it's all completely untrue. The reason why Krowski persistently makes me a key witness is probably because he's rather economical with the truth. Summarizing the book, Rubel states, This book is a botched piece of work, not worth being printed. My comrades who are still alive refuse to buy it. Dr. Topolsk summarizes Krowski the following way. While his first non-fiction books about the Second World War were at least fairly accurate accounts of former Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS soldiers, Krowski soon began embellishing those stories, adding fictional passages and distorting facts and historical events. Even soldiers who had first valued him as an author eventually distanced themselves from the writing maniac Krowski and his nonsense more and more vehemently. So, for example, here is Ted Barris' book on Canadian Dambuster Air Crews, which I'm currently reading. Now, if you flip to the back of the book, you will see the sources the author used to write this book, and where he cited specific sources in his various chapters. This kind of thing is standard for any history book written in the last 40 years at least, probably longer, and it shows where the author got the information he is using from, and that he's not making things up. Here's Kurowski's Panzer Ace, and if you flip to the back of the book, you will see nothing, because Kurowski don't list no sources in his books. I mean, what more can you say? I would have gone fairly marks in grade 8 had I not attached a bibliography to my essay, so a historical book, not having a bibliography, is rather incredible, especially given the above-dimensioned issues of the author's tendency to make stuff up. Oh look, Kurowski states here that the Panther tank caught fire easily due to its hydraulic steering fluid, I've never heard about that before. What technical sources did he use to check? Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Rudolf von Ribbentrop fought as an infantry commander in the last weeks of the war. I'd like to read more about that. What resources can I consult to see? Uh, oh. Whoa, it seems pretty incredible that heavy Panzer Regiment Bach destroyed hundreds of Soviet tanks for so few losses. What sources did Kurowski consult to check these? No. Oh. Yes, there's pretty much nothing to go off of if you want to read up more on a subject mentioned by Kurowski or to fact check his work. And it's strange because Kurowski obviously did do some research and interviews for his book, but he just doesn't list any of it. Considering citing sources has been a thing done by historians for decades, often to prove what they are writing is true, it says something about Kurowski that he doesn't seem to do the same. The first chapter in Krosky's Pan's Race 1 looks at the combat career of Franz Baker, starting with his service during the Battle of France in a Panzer 35T, in which he was part of the 6th Panzer Division. The 68-page chapter follows his exploits through France, Barbarossa, the relief attempt at Stalingrad, Kursk, and climaxes with his command of Heavy Panzer Regiment Baker, a temporary composite Panther Tiger unit that allegedly destroyed over 250 Soviet tanks for the permanent loss of 10 of their own tanks. In the chapter, we get blow-by-blow -blow accounts of the tank duels Baker took part in, with actual quoted commands given by Baker while he was under fire in his tank, conversations which occurred between soldiers, and then something strange happens. Whereas 67 pages cover his service from May 1942 to May 1944, little more than a single page covers his remaining wartime service from May 1944 to May 1945. 
Indeed, only three paragraphs cover his time as commander of Panzer Brigade 106 during its fighting in the autumn and winter of 1944. Kurosky summarizes this period by stating, Starting in mid-September, Dr. Baker and his brigade saw action in the area south of Metz under the command of 12th SS Panzer Corps. Once again, Baker distinguished himself through the prudent yet decisive leadership of his armored unit. Prudent yet decisive leadership. That's a funny way of saying Baker got his command f***ing wrecked in its first battle because that's actually what happened. Though the exact details are difficult to find, it seems Baker launched his very green brigade in a two-pronged night attack against the by then veteran 90th U.S. Infantry Division, believing the U.S. troops would break and run once his troops broke through the frontline position. As it turns out, launching an attack whose entire success hinges on your enemy panicking and running is not the best idea. Unfortunately for Panzer Brigade 106, despite driving through the 90th Division's front line during the night, the American soldiers did not panic and flee. Thus, when dawn broke, the men of Panzer Brigade 106 found that they had unwittingly put themselves into a pocket in the rear of the 90th Division, whose soldiers were now counterattacking with tanks, artillery, and air support. Over the course of the next several hours, one of Panzer Brigade's 106 columns was largely annihilated as an attempt to extradite itself from the self-imposed pocket, while the other column was badly mauled escaping. The 90th Infantry Division after action report states some 30 German tanks were destroyed or abandoned, along with 60 half-tracks and 100 assorted other vehicles. 764 prisoners of war were taken on September 8th, many from Panzer Brigade 106, plus an undetermined number of Germans were killed or wounded. In this extremely lopsided defeat, 75% of the combat strength of Panzer Brigade 106 was lost in return for inflicting very little damage on the American forces. Al Krosky comes to admit this awful debacle from his book while claiming that September saw Baker displaying prudent yet decisive leadership is a mystery. Or perhaps such a scroop was inconvenient for the narrative of Baker the Panzer Ace that Krosky had spent the last 67 pages relating. It wouldn't be the only example of defeats being lost over in his book. In the chapter on von Ribbentrop's several failed attacks by the tanks of 12th SS Panzer, including attacks led by Ribbentrop himself, are seemingly omitted or downplayed by Kurowski. The unfortunate reality is that, if one wants factual retelling of these German tanks commanders' combat careers, Kurowski's Panzer races is not the place to find them. Perhaps the most popular benchmark among World War II enthusiasts for success when it comes to Second World War tank combat is kill claims or kill ratios achieved by tank commanders or tank types. The Panzer Ace books embrace this cult of numbers with even the title of the book invoking the Air Force concept of the Ace, a skilled fighter pilot who destroys five or more aircraft. Anyone who reads Panzer Aces will be fed a large diet of alleged kill claims achieved personally by the Panzer Ace in question or by the unit the Panzer Ace commands, so no doubt exists that these men were truly aces. As the above quote shows, even in defeat, the Panzer Ace invariably lays waste to large numbers of the numerically superior enemy tanks, affirming their superior individual fighting skill and tactical prowess. In reality, much of the post-war popular mythology that is built up around tank kill claims by Panzers is built on shaky evidence. For starters, there does not seem to have been any attempt to vet the kill claims made by German tank crews as no similar system to the Luftwaffe's claim vetting system was employed by the Wehrmacht. Both the German High Command and the Eastern Front Intelligence Services applied reductions of up to 50% on the kill tallies submitted by German field units in the East, as they believed double claiming inflated the kill tallies they were receiving. As well, the idea of keeping count of an individual Panzer commander's kills does not seem to have been all that common during the war. Located in the footnotes in Dr. Topol's article on Kurowski is this gem about Kurt Knipsel, often claimed to be the highest scoring tank ace in history. Elfried Rubel, who at the time was a staff officer in the 503rd Heavy Panzer Battalion, pointed out that the exact number of Kurt Knipsel's tank kills could not be confirmed because the battalion did not use to count destroyed tanks or ascribe them to individual gunner or tank commanders. None of these issues exactly lend credibility to the tank kill claim numbers listed in books or online for German panzer races or units, nor the numbers quoted in Kurowski's book. Let's go back to the quoted action shown at the start of this section. This ends von Ribbentrop's report. It makes little mention of the company's major achievement and its total of enemy tanks destroyed. Despite its losses, 8th July had been a successful day for 3rd Company. It destroyed 27 enemy tanks, as well as 8 Bren gun carriers and 4 anti-tank guns. 
SS Lieutenant von Ribbentrop contributed this total by knocking out several enemy tanks. Here Kurowski is referencing the counterattack by 13 Panther tanks of 3rd Company, Panzer Regiment 12 of the 12th SS Panzer Division, against Canadian troops in armor at the village of Buron on July 8th. Though the counterattack failed to eject the Canadians from the village, Krauski still attributes success due to Ribbentrop's 3rd Company destroying 27 Allied tanks plus other equipment. So did von Ribbentrop and his unit really destroy that many tanks? Well, probably not. Though determining exactly what destroyed what in this battle is very challenging, Ribbentrop's unit seems to have been mostly unengaged until they counterattacked Allied forces at Buron. The Sherbrooke Fusiliers attacked Buron on July 8th with 15 Shermans and A Squadron, of which only 8 tanks made it through Buron to meet von Ribbentrop's attack. Supporting them were 8 M10 Achilles from the 245th Anti-Tank Battery, Royal Artillery, that also met Ribbentrop's counterattack. And the following engagement, 6 M10s were put out of action. Eight squadrons' losses are unclear, but when they consolidated on the high ground south of Buron, only four of the eight tanks were still operational. Third Company may have also accounted for two tanks from the 1st Hussars, which supported an attack on the Abbey de Ardennes, and possibly one or two tanks from B Squadron of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers at Goshi. In my estimation, maybe around half of the 27 kills Kurowski claims 3rd Company achieved look to be valid, which lines up well with the 50% reduction German High Command applied to the tank estimates they received from their field units. 3rd Company itself was reduced from 13 operational Panthers to only 2 by the end of the battle, with 7 Panthers being complete losses. The major achievement Kurowski claims von Ribbentrop achieved looks decidedly less major. In fact, almost every tank in 3rd Company had been put out of action in this repulse. Similarly, Krauski details another attack by Ribbentrop against U.S. forces around Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. For the first time since Normandy, Rudolf von Ribbentrop again led his tanks against the enemy. The tanks rolled into Michamp and Orbosi and drove the enemy back. By evening, both villages were firmly in the hands of von Ribbentrop's battle group. His tanks had destroyed nine enemy tanks, several anti-tank guns, and other weapons. Once again, this account can't be corroborated against Allied records. The forces in Michamp and Orbelsi in January 2nd, 1945, was infantry of the 50th Armored Infantry Battalion, minus one company, C Company of the 68th Tank Battalion, a platoon of the 603rd Tank Destroyer Battalion, all of which were parts of Task Force Wall, Combat Command B, 6th Armored Division. Nothing in the after-action report for Combat Command B, the 50th Armored Infantry Battalion, and the 68th Tank Battalion unit histories mention any losses for C Company on this day supporting the attack on Michamp and Orbosia. The very detailed after-action report for the 603rd Tank Destroy Battalion records no losses that day either. The 50th Armored Infantry Battalion after-action report and unit history states that C Company, which was clear in Michamp, was attacked by armor and infantry, resulting in the unit pulling back while being subjected to heavy indirect fire. However, Orbo C seems to have been willingly abandoned by Task Force Wall as a result of the failure of Task Force Duval to take Arlencourt, which left the positions at Orbo C very exposed in the face of growing German strength. The after-action report for Combat Command B lists total tank losses for the forces under its command for the month of January, some 26 medium tanks and two light tanks. About 14 medium tanks were lost on the failed attack on Arlon Court by B Company, 60th Tank Battalion, and four more were lost by A Company on January 3rd. If Rossi's tally for Ribbentrop's attack in Michamp and Orbo C was accurate, then the total tank losses for Combat Command B would be 27 tanks by January 3rd. However, Combat Command B was in constant and heavy fighting for the whole of January. Essentially, no other tanks could have been lost during the heavy German attacks on the 6th Armored Division from January 3rd to 8th, nor the U.S. offenses from January 3rd to 26th. This seems to be an impossibility, and to a certain extent, one has to wonder if the supposed destruction of nine tanks by Ribbentrop's unit even happened. Interestingly, Hubert Meyer's second volume of the History of the 12th SS Division merely states Ribbentrop's unit occupied Michamp and Orbelsi after the 50th Armored Infantry Battalion abandoned these positions. It doesn't mention Ribbentrop's unit knocking out any U.S. vehicles in this action. Once again, the lack of sources in the book makes it impossible to know where Kurowski got his kill tallies from. On the whole, it seems Krauski's kill tallies are somewhat less than reliable, which is a rather big weakness for a book that focuses on panzer aces, men who by definition must have destroyed lots of tanks. So in the chapter on Michael Wittmann, Krauski talks about Wittmann's reaction to his tank inadvertently running over a Soviet soldier from a tank hunting unit during the Battle of Kursk. Before he could close the hatch, he heard a terrible scream. Wittmann clutched his teeth. There was a faint taste of blood on his tongue. He felt sick from the thought of what just happened outside. 
Vitman forced himself to concentrate on the job at hand. He had five tanks and 25 men to worry about. How could Krakowski possibly know any of this? Michael Whitman died in Normandy. He didn't leave a diary or writings of any kind. He certainly didn't come back from the dead to tell Krakowski that he faintly tasted blood on his tongue or felt sick when the Soviet soldier was supposedly run over. How could Krakowski possibly know what Whitman felt in that moment? It certainly doesn't seem like the kind of thing Whitman would confide in a fellow soldier. Hey Hans, you know during that battle when we ran that dude over? Yeah, I totally felt sick and had a faint taste of blood on my tongue when that happened, but I forced myself to concentrate on the job at hand because people depended on me. It just doesn't sound like the kind of conversation soldiers would have with each other, especially men from that time period who are a bit more stoic than people today. It reminds me of the German veteran Rolf Kleinman's line that Krauski just filled the facts with fanciful tales, because while the incident of Whitman's tank running over a Soviet soldier may be true, the, the reaction of Whitman Krauski provided sounds like something someone would make up for dramatic impact. So what do you get from reading Pan's races? You get the kill tallies of Panzer Aces destroying large numbers of Allied tanks, tallies which are probably far above what was actually destroyed. You get a chronicle of Panzer Aces combat careers, which leave out their failures or excuses any events that make them look bad. You will hear the stories of Panzer Aces exploits, which you have no idea are true because the author does not cite where he got this information from. And you will get a book written by a man even German World War II veterans have come to see as a liar and a storyteller. As I said at the start, this book inhabits many people's bookshelves, including my own, for the, probably the last 15 years. Well, perhaps it's time it goes onto the only bookshelf it deserves to be on.